All right, Agile for Humans episode something, something, something. I've lost track, but it's a good one, guys. This is with Yuval Urit. We're talking about um, Scrum and Kanban, but it's not a versus episode like so many other shows do. What we're saying is professional Scrum with Kanban. So we'll be right back in a second here with Yuval Urit talking about how Scrum and Kanban sitting in a tree might make sense. Welcome to Agile for Humans. Our goal is to bring humanity back into the world of software delivery with agile values, principles, and practices. We gather top agilists from around the globe to share insights and help you grow as servant leaders in your organizations. We seek to open minds, change hearts, and deliver value into the world. Now here is our host, professional scrum trainer and agile practitioner, Ryan Ripley. All right, Yuval, thanks for joining us on Agile for Humans. Um, and I'm excited. So we were in, where were we at? We were in Detroit, right? Yes. So we were up at Agile and Beyond. So by the way, if you've never been to Agile and Beyond, um, I love that conference. Just a really awesome experience. The organizers treat us really well as speakers. The attendees seem to have a really good time. I actually went to a few talks, which is why, well, it's one of many reasons why Yuval and I are talking today. But uh, Yuval, what did you think of Agile and Beyond? I only managed to drop in for a couple of hours in between, you know, we being in Indiana and getting back home for the weekend, but I like what I've seen. Uh, good energies in the talks that I went to, good discussions over lunch, um, good evening with the speaker, so definitely looking forward to the next time. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. They've taken this local conference, right? So it started out, you know, as like a, as this this thing up in Michigan, this this uh, fledgling conference. I think they had over a thousand people this year. Really yeah, wild it was turnout. Crazy so, big. But yeah, we had a good time. Well, one of the sessions that I dropped into, and I I'm trying to be a better conference attendee. I used to, like, I'll show up at a conference and I'll I'll do my talks, and kind of hang out in the hallway or kind of hide in the speaker room. And I thought, nah, that's not cool. I need to start. I need to be in these sessions. And when I saw that Yuval, so Full transparency, Yuval is a fellow uh, professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. He's also a safe trainer. Um, he's one of the guys over at Agile Sparks. They do a lot of awesome work here in the United States and over in Israel. If you're looking for some, some help with uh, your Agile transformations, Agile Sparks is certainly a great place to look. Um, but Yuval was doing uh, this talk on professional Scrum with Kanban. It's a topic that I'm really interested in. And then when Dave West decided to pop in and kind of impromptu join Yuval, I was like, all right, I got to see this. Uh, and this talk, I mean, it. what surprised me, Yuval, is that um, when people think about Scrum and Kanban, it's this versus, it's this, you know, pick one or the other, or Scrum is good for projects and or products, and Kanban is good for just support tickets or support activities. And what you, along with Dave, did... I mean, there's probably 50 to 75 people standing room only. Those people left the room going, holy cow, we don't understand the sprint, flow metrics. It kind of leaves people on fire. What, what is it about the combination of Scrum and Kanban that you just you think is so, I guess, so, so powerful? I think that, I mean, I've been using them together since around 2007, okay? Uh, um, and... I've seen Scrum without something like Kanban, and I've seen Kanban without something like Scrum, and they both improve dramatically what you're already doing, but you've left something to be desired. Um, for example, a lot of teams that you know use Scrum without thinking about Kanban, they're missing two great things. They're missing an understanding and a focus on flow within the sprint and into the sprint and what's going on beyond the sprint. And um, th this lack of focus on flow actually leads them to focus on some unhealthy things. Uh, like there's so much useless discussion. I, and, you know, I, I, you know, I go into those runs in those conference talks and so far nobody's you know, talk took too much offense uh, out of it. But, uh, you know, I, I'm a burn down chart hater. 
I'm kind of a story points hater. Uh, I can understand where these things have a place, um, but most people using Scrum just, you know, focus on those instead of on the heart of Scrum. Um, and, and, you know, the heart of Scrum to me is, uh, you know, we've been through the uh, trainer experience together and, uh, you know, empiricism, the self-organization, the continuous improvement, that's the heart of Scrum. There are rules for how to do things around it, um, but, you know, story points aren't the heart of Scrum, tasks aren't the heart of Scrum, burndowns aren't the heart of Scrum, and if you see empiricism as the heart of Scrum, then that means not just transparency, inspection, and adaptation, it also means, hey, how quickly do you get through that loop? And how quickly do you get through that loop to some transparency via working software and the ability to inspect and adapt it? Well, that's a function of your sprint length. That's one aspect. But it's also a function of your cycle times or whatever you want to call those. The, the time it takes you from the moment you start something, not just your sprint, something, to the moment that you you know, can see it working, get some feedback, from your product owner, from your stakeholders, deploy to production, get it going, take it out for a spin, and that's that. That is flow. Flow is about closing that feedback loop faster, being aware of your feedback loop and closing it faster. And Kanban is just you know one good tool to help you make that flow transparent and do something about it. So, you, yeah, you've mentioned this concept of flow, which may not uh, necessarily be, be familiar with all of the, the listeners out there. I, I think you've given the, this really interesting kind of general intro to it. So are there ways that uh, people can kind of measure flow to make it, I guess, more of a real concrete kind of concept? Yeah. So the best measure that we know of on flow is um, cycle time. So cycle time is basically a metric that looks at uh, time, obviously. You start the clock when you start to process something, when something you know goes into what we call work in progress, and you stop the clock at the finish line. Now, what's the starting point? What's the finish line? Well, let's start simple and say when you start to actually design some some work, some product backlog item if you want to use uh, Scrum, and the finish line is when it's done. And that could be days, it could be weeks, it's you know really up to you and your process how that looks like. Um, and the if you're able to get to faster cycle times um, and reduce the amount of variability that you have in your cycle times, that means that you have better flow. If you want to take a less um, mathematical way around it, what I do is I talk about you know, the fact that a lot of the time our, our processes look like swamps while what we want is actually to see rivers, fast flowing rivers, the ones you, uh, you can go, go uh, have fun rafting on. And, you know, even people, uh, it's much worse when people, you know, when you go to an organization that is using, uh, you know, a very traditional way of working, you can see cycle times that are, that are measured in months um, because People are working on very big pieces, very big, um, you know, features. They don't break them down into smaller pieces. So, the cycle times are, are kind of frightening um, when you go into an organization that is using Scrum. So, if they're using Scrum well, the there are a couple of things that they're doing that should already improve their flow. They're breaking work into. Um, product backlog items that should fit into a sprint. So by design, that creates um, the situation where you should see better flow. And they're ideally only pulling into the sprint the amount of work that they can actually work on. So they are creating a pool system 
even without caring about cycle time or Kanban, that's what a good scrum team should do. Uh, how many scrum teams, you know, have you seen that do this by design? Yeah, I don't see it very often. Um, something that I know you and I talk about in our in our PSM classes, uh, the notion of a team versus a, a, a group of loosely associated people, right? So a yep. team would a team of nine people might only pull in three pieces of three units of work at a time, and really swarm and work on that and set that whip limit so that you know that's so they get that flow efficiency, right? They can continually get that that amount of work through. Most of the teams that I start coaching or working with or we run into in training classes, if there's nine people, they've pulled nine pieces of work and very few things get finished, and we have to start you know, ramping down whip limit or setting that whip limit. Uh, and actually, honestly, Yvel, a lot of my early coaching with new teams is really trying to get people to learn how to work together on that, on that lower uh, number, on, that, on those three pieces of work. And I have found once they get that, um, this flow stuff really makes sense to them. They kind of get it. Like, oh, if we have nine people, we pull in nine things, we're all jammed up, we can't help each other, we get stuck, work item aging, Another really great flow metric that I've used in the past, um, which is basically as a scrum master or as a dev team. Actually, I love it when the dev team does this. Just count the number of days that a, a piece of work stays in a, cer a certain status, right? A lap yeah, time. So in a certain, I mean, that yeah. all these things, right? But your question is, does this happen naturally? No, <laughs> not at all. No. So, so that's why, you know, what... Um, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do is to educate Scrum Masters that, you know, it's not just about setting up, you know, their Scrum team and, you know, helping their team run a daily Scrum or sprint planning. They need to think about flow as well. A professional Scrum Master needs to understand flow, needs to help their team understand uh, flow. And there's this one, I don't know if this team had a Scrum Master, but if if it was a Scrum Master, you know, he gets the Congressional Medal of Honor from my perspective. Um, there's this uh, image that I, I show in the, in the class and in my conference talks, which um, basically showed that this team realized that, uh, you know what, we really want to see the stuff that is stuck. Um, we, we know that, um, you know, we, we have this uh, question, are we blocked? Do we have any impediment that we ask people uh, to talk about in the daily scrum? But a lot of the time, people kind of shy away from saying we're blocked. They, they would say, yeah, we're making progress. No, you know, it's going harder than we thought. Um, so in order to improve the transparency, what this team did is it said, you know, for every card that we start, for every item that we start, on our Kanban board, on our visibility board, let's take some banana peel and post it on the card. And hopefully, if the card really flows well, by the time, you know, the card would be done by the time that the banana peel grows uh, really dark and smelly. But in some cases, it would not be done, and then there would be a multi-sensory indication that something is going wrong and we uh, need to talk about what to do with this item. Could we break it down into smaller pieces? Could we help each other? Is there any impediment we can address ourselves? Can, do we need the Scrum Master to pitch in? Uh, maybe pull in the product owner? Do something about it right now, not wait for the retrospective to deal with flow issues during the sprint. And then in the retrospective, you can also look at those uh, metrics um, like the cycle time after the car is finished and try to learn what's what's going on and do something about it. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I've seen far too many times where, um, and I, I've done this myself, where we've relied on velocity, we've relied on burn down charts. Um, but you know what? I, I remember very distinctly, I had a fellow scrum master at an organization come up to me and um, he was very excited. He's like, Ryan, my burn down chart is perfect. And I'm like, okay, um, that's awesome. And he actually had the burn down chart in his hand. I'm like, that's awesome. Can I see the latest increment you guys released? I can't wait to see what you're what you're delivering. He's like, what are you talking about? We haven't shipped anything in six months. I'm like, why are you showing me a burn down? 
And uh, likewise, if he had a cumulative flow diagram in his hand and nothing getting to done, I, at least flow metrics would have pointed this out very quickly. I don't think he ever would have brought it to my attention, right? But it, it, depending I, on his definition of done, right? Right, right, right. But what yeah. I'm finding is that um, applying these metrics and applying these concepts, I mean, I it just brings to light. And again, there's a lot of context. So there's a lot of storytelling that goes along with, you know, if you're calculating, you know, cycle time throughput, if you're looking at whip limits, if you're looking at item aging, context is king. I mean, context is everything, right? There could be very good reasons why a cumulative flow diagram, why certain boundaries start expanding or why, um, you know, cycle time dips. If everyone's on, on holiday, if we're in Europe and everyone's out for the month of August, the metrics are going to plummet, right? But these metrics can quantify and, and really bring to light certain issues that I've not seen velocity and burn downs really help us do. Kind of interesting, uh, I had to go back and figure out the math here, right? And so after seeing your talk, I was like, all right, flow makes sense. I totally get um, how this improves the sprint. What I love about even the PSK, uh, the Professional Scrum with Kanban course, I, my initial thought was, all right, we're just taking the sprint and dissecting it and figuring out how to make work um, go well in it. But what I've realized, or what I've come to realize too, is that you guys are looking at the boundaries before and after the sprint as well. And I wanted to figure out, well, why does that make sense and how does the math work? And so I grabbed your co-steward's book, um, Actionable Agile Metrics for Predictability. So Daniel Vacanti, mm -hmm. along with, so arguably, I'm going to go ahead and say this, Daniel Vacanti in created Kanban uh, in its current form that we use today in, in many Agile organizations. Um, teamed up with Yuval Urit and a lot of the Scrum.org staff put together this professional Scrum with Kanban course um, and used a lot of interesting practices. The application of Little's Law, and it took me a long time to wrap my head around this, Yuval, to be honest. Like the idea of you know, Little's Law, where, you know, basically cycle time equals work in progress over throughput. And the implications of that, of that equation, right? And how moving one of these levers changes another. Um, changing your whip limit to being lower will probably improve your cycle time. All of those implications that happen. What I really got fascinated about, something that you and Daniel talk about pretty consistently, is that it's not the equation or the math or the numbers that's the most important thing. It's the assumptions that you have to hold true in your system of work uh, for this equation to, to be accurate that really matter. And I, and I have found that, um, and I'll let, I'm going to let you go into this because I'm just kind of ranting and raving uh, a little bit, but the idea here is that if you can hold a few assumptions to be true, Little's Law applies to flow, can it optimize your sprint, but it also kind of gives you this set of of things that you have to work towards. Can you go into that just a little bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll just give one example. Um, so you mentioned you, a lot of your work with teams is on um, learning to work with three items at the same time instead of nine items at the same time. And, and I share that uh, experience. That's a lot of the work that I do as well. So if you look at it from the perspective of Lidl's law, in theory, because there's like this sort of triangle between um, your capacity, let's call it the, the throughput of the, the system, the ability of the people to actually deliver working uh, software, and the amount of things that you're working on at the same time, your work in process, work in progress, um, and the cycle time. If we reduce the working process uh, by a factor of three, um, assuming that we keep having the same amount of people with the same capabilities, the same sort of process, our cycle time should improve by a factor of three as well. But here is where it gets really, really difficult because, um, you know, if you just take uh, for example, or, um, you know, a restaurant or your kitchen at home and you say, instead of having, um, you know, nine people working each on their own dish, let's have 
those nine people collaborating on just three dishes at a time. I'm guessing, I just have that uh, restaurant in mind or the way I cook <laughs> in the kitchen in mind. Your throughput is not going to be the same sort of throughput. Maybe your cycle time would improve, maybe not, but the throughput would suffer because there's an assumption here. The same assumption that we're making when we're applying this in the world of software, the assumption that the kitchen is big enough for a set of people, that the code, the architecture of the system, the knowledge of the people um, when it comes to the software or product, hardware, whatever that they're working on, is such that they could actually go in and work together. And that's, I don't know, that's what we would like to see, but a lot of the, the work that teams have to, to do and that, uh, you know, scrum masters and coaches work with them on is to actually get from here to there. And that's just one assumption of Lidl's law that you need to be very careful of and to actually work with. Not just make the assumption, but make it true. Yeah, make it, just, it happen. And, and for the listeners out there, I, I, I'd imagine there's a definition of terms here that, that we should look at, right? So cycle time, it's from uh, start to finish. So the, the elapsed mm -hmm. time that an item, that a work item is spending in, in progress, right? Yeah, so, regardless of... You know, it's not about effort or right. active time, just elapsed calendar time. Now, throughput would be uh, units of work completed within a, a, a length of time, right? So Regardless perhaps, of size, yeah. Right, so the number of discrete items of work completed within a sprint would be an expression of throughput. Yep. And then yep. work in progress is, of course, the number of, of items that are in progress um, at, any, at any given point. Mm -hmm. um, and so with those terms defined, Little's Law really comes in and shows the, the interplay and inter interrelationship of cycle time throughput and work in progress and how, you know, following certain assumptions, you know, one of them being that your, your processes are, are somewhat stable. Team size is stable, team composition, skill set, surrounding practices are stable. You know, with, with a, a base set of assumptions, we can move the dials a bit on cycle time throughput and actually in work in progress and change the way that teams work to, to hopefully improve the flow of work through a system. Did I get that right? Yep. Yep. Think about it this way. If you have, um, I don't know, let's take a restaurant again and we know, or a Starbucks, um, and we know that the cycle time in Starbucks is, I don't know, three minutes. I haven't been to a Starbucks uh, recently, Let, let's say three minutes. Uh, assuming uh, room, you know, around three people, you know, in the queue uh, waiting to get coffee. If suddenly something happens and there's a queue going all the way to the door and uh, outside the street for some reason, I don't know, they're giving out uh, free coffee today, we can't make any assumptions about this cycle time anymore because the system is unstable. We're allowing way more work. Uh, we're taking on some what we call flow debt. We're saying yes to a lot of our clients in order to keep them in the store, but that means that it would be harder for us to give them uh, good service. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, and the problem with this topic is, is that like I get fired up over the metrics and the math and the, what what I have done as a scrum master, so if we pull this to a practical stance, right? Um, and I think you've done this too. I think there are very simple things we can do that actually get us the majority of the benefits of flow. Um, if we put a whip limit in place, if we track item aging, if we start calculating cycle time and seeing if there's ways to optimize it through lowering whip, we start seeing those benefits, and then as we see those benefits, I think we dig into the math. Cumulative flow diagrams can start bringing things to light. Um, I think there's some other tools that I won't really get into too deeply. Um, we're going to save some of that for the book, for people to check out the book, people to check out the class. But uh, in any case, Yuval, if people were, 
they wanted to start, if there was a way that they could start seeing flow really uplift their teams, what's the practice that you would say that people could start with to see an impact? So first, they should burn their burn down charts. <laughs> That's the thing to start with. Um, and I mean, I'm not a, you know, yeah, I know. I'm not burn down chart hater um, because I've seen them abused. Um, I've seen burn downs um, become tools where people with the need for control um, of the situation, um, you know, use something to give them some notion of, you know, work breakdown structure and remaining work and go into details that, you know, has nothing to do with empiricism and with flow. So start with burning your burn down charts for a short sprint. You don't really need a burn down chart to know where you are on things. So the first thing you should actually do after you burn your burn down chart is probably have some way to look at the flow in the system. And the best way we know, it's not the only one, but the best way we know is to create a common board. Basically set up a common board with um, your workflow in there and you know, ideally a physical board if your team is co-located. If not, you can use any sort of um, you know, online uh, common tools these days. There are a lot of tools that uh, that work, um, and basically have a lane for each step of your workflow. If you're focusing on your uh, Scrum sprint, you could start with your sprint backlog, finish with done according to your definition of done, and think about okay, what are the stages that our work goes through in between? Maybe it's you know, just in progress, maybe it's coding and then testing and fixing and then done, maybe it's some design work, maybe it's some research, whatever your process is, create a common board that reflects it. And then basically as you're going through the sprint, uh, make sure that the board reflects where your product backlog items are, where your work is. And you will start to see swamps or rivers. And if you're starting to see a swamp, which means that a lot of the cards are moving together, or you see a tsunami, all of the cards moving through the board in, you know, in one big sequence, this is where you start to uh, constrain the flow using work in process limits. So you basically want to look at each one of the steps and say, okay, based on our team size, how many items should we have? have in this stage. So let's say coding is the first stage and we have three developers on the development team. Does it make sense to have an unlimited amount of work there? Probably not. Um, is the right number three? Is the right number four? Is the right number five? Is the right number one? Because we want to go into more programming? I don't know. It's something you need to figure out. There are some you know, some rules of thumb, some heuristics around it. A lot of people, as a starting point, just multiply the amount of people working in a certain stage or the number of pairs working uh, in a certain uh, stage by one and a half. So three people take five into account. And remember that the work will be in your work in process limit or will need to obey your work in process limit, even though you're, fin you're finished it and it's waiting for somebody else to pull it in. So for example, if I send you an email, Ryan, the email, you know, once I finish it and it's in my send queue, I'll think, okay, from a multitasking perspective, I don't care about that email anymore. I'm done with it. But you're not working on it either because you're teaching that day or something, or I don't know what you're doing. You haven't started reading the email and doing something about it. So where is it? And when we're talking about a pool system, I want to be aware of how many emails I sent you and you haven't started working on them yet. The number is not very high, but if it gets to the point that there are 10 emails that I've sent you, Ryan, and you know, there's nothing going on there. It doesn't make sense for me to send another email. It makes sense to pick up the phone, for example, and talk about, okay, 
Do we need a better system? Do we need to work together? Do you need any help doing all of those things that we're doing for that class that we're doing together in August? Um, because it doesn't make sense for me to just do stuff on my side and just forget about it. And this pattern of limiting working process in a way that ties together the people working together is actually one of the most powerful techniques for getting teams to actually behave as teams, to drive teamwork, to create self-organization, because we wouldn't need anybody to come in and tell us to work together. At some point, the WIP limit would tell me, Yuval, go figure it out with Ryan. You, you need to figure it out. The WIP limits kind of guide us that way. And, and that's why I think WIP limits are one of the most powerful tools that the Scrum Master could have. Well, I think, I, I, first of all, I of course, totally agree. What I love about... Uh, the class, the concepts, applying uh, Kanban practices to Scrum or Scrum to Kanban. I mean, either way, it, I think we get to the same spot. What we're doing is really we're turning empiricism up to 11. And this really makes me happy. I've started saying I got caught in a, in a conference talk um, a few months back where someone asked me a question about, you know, why are you so loyal to Scrum? And I, before I caught myself saying it, I said, I'm not. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, I'm really not. What, I, what I'm loyal to is empiricism. Mm -hmm. I love transparency, inspection, and adaptation. And I think the current Scrum body of work, the Scrum Guide, all of those things, they do a great job of teaching us how to imply, how to apply empiricism to product development. All right, we build an increment. How are you going to inspect and adapt it? But I think this class and what the PSK has done, it said, well, wait a minute. What if we applied empiricism directly to the way we're working? And I think that's a different take, right? So now we're talking about, as a team, how much work in progress can we handle before our cycle time gets out of control and our throughput grinds to a halt? What a great mm -hmm. question. Now, how do we make that visible? Well, we make that visible through item aging and tracking cycle time and, tech and tracking throughput and looking, how have I made this visible? Physical team boards, as you mentioned, with appropriate uh, Kanban lanes and red and green dots. Every day an item doesn't move, it gets a red dot. Every day it moves, it gets a green dot. Very simple visual visualization techniques to where someone can look at a card and say, there's five dots on this thing and we're doing a two-week sprint. That means half of our sprint, this thing is sat in this state. What is going on? So what we're doing, we're, it creates an opportunity for a conversation, which is, a, as you know, Yuval, as we teach Scrum Masters, creating the opportunity to have a new conversation, to make a new decision, a better decision over and over and over and over is one of our key roles. So now we have this, this set of metrics, this tool set, to where it brings a lot of these, these deeper rooted sprints and team-based issues to light. It brings transparency to it. We have great, uh, a great ability to inspect now because in real time we can see these issues, whether it's cycle time throughput or it's a, a team-based getting stuck kind of thing. Uh, and we can make adaptations in real time. We're not waiting for the retro. We're actually able to address at the daily scrum uh, what's going on in real time. It, it just brings more meaning to all of these events, right? The daily scrum is a richer event. The sprint planning sessions are richer. Uh, all of these events just really come to life because now we have this deeper insight into how work is flowing through our system. But I think even more importantly, how we're working together. And I think this really filled a, an interesting gap I don't know. What do you think? Am I have I am I lost here, or has this? No, this no. Really I, I fully agree with you. Um, I, I see myself as you know I'm uh, I'm not loyal to Kanban. I'm not loyal to Scrum. I am loyal to flow and empiricism, and I think there's a lot of interplay between those two concepts that make them very powerful together, and. One interesting thing I hear almost in every class that I run, in every professional Scrum with Kanban class that I run, is I hear from people that have lots of Scrum experience. They've been through breaks from classes. They have a, they gain a new understanding of Scrum in the class. They kind of, you know, um, go through this process where 
their understanding of what Scrum is is um, crystallized, or, or they see the, the gem, uh, the diamond of, of Scrum inside a wrapping with a lot of um, coal that is not necessarily uh, where the value is coming from, and, and they say, you know what, I see the sprint as the dramatically different thing now. I, I see sprint planning in a new light. I see the daily scrum in a new light. It's beautiful uh, when this happens. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that um, I love talking about this uh, so much, both in conferences and, and doing the, the class. So I'm really glad that you know we have this opportunity to do this work with um, you know the scrum community. Yeah, even the so the creation of the class. I mean, we can maybe we'll go meta here for a second. So I, I've I've mentioned your your co-steward Daniel Vacanti, creator of Kanban, author of Actionable uh, Agile Metrics for Predictability. Um, you in your own right, Yuval, deep background in Kanban, um, deep background in Scrum, uh, safe trainer. I mean, you've basically, you've got all the aspects of, of agility um, and you've, you've seen a lot of things. There's a third person who really helped bring this course to light, Steve Porter within Scrum.org, really championed this idea um, and really wanted to see a bridge built. You know, Steve, is, is, I want to be like Steve when I finally grow up someday. He sees opportunities to build bridges where where I, I, I don't necessarily uh, initially see them. But I love the fact that he saw this bridge that he brought, you know, you and Daniel together, really worked within uh, the Scrum.org community to bring PSK to life. What's it like actually, so let me step back. I think a lot of us have taken the two-day classes, right? So I've, I've gone to many, many courses. I know you have as well. I think a lot of the listeners, a lot of the listeners have come to our classes, to be honest. And that's, it's awesome to see them there. Um, but what's it like being on the other side of it, trying to create, you know, you, you've got Daniel, you've got Steve, you got yourself, all these interesting perspectives, trying to put together two days of content that are, that are just going to have people walking out almost on fire about the, the power of a sprint, the importance of flow, uh, trying to figure out metrics that matter, true forecasting. I mean, you're sending people out of here with, I mean, they've just got to be going back and annoying the heck out of their coworkers with all these new ideas, right? But what's it like, you know, putting together this experience and really trying to create this this complete, comprehensive two day experience where people really walk away with a ton of value? It's a very rewarding and challenging experience, I'd say. Uh, it's still an ongoing experience. So the class has been out there. For a bit more than a year, um, and we've had, you know, many hundreds of people that have taken the class, but it's still being um, adopted, right? We, we use empiricism. Um, we want to gain transparency on how people feel with the class, inspect and adapt it. So. There are a lot of different things that we try to do with the class. We um, brought in concepts around metrics, some of those that we discussed, some things beyond uh, what we've discussed. Um, we want to deal with the challenge that we have people coming in from different backgrounds uh, into the class and get them up to speed on a you know, certain baseline of Scrum and Kanban, mainly Kanban. Uh, in the class and then ask questions like, you know, okay, you're a scrum practitioner, you understand uh, some of the gaps, you now understand some of the gaps with scrum, you now understand Kanban on its own, that's like day one of the class. Um, you know, most of it is experiential, uh, using simulations and exercises. And then on day two, we go through the gauntlet of, okay, how do we actually um, do something about this? How do we take Scrum and add Kanban to it? How does it impact each one of the Scrum um, events, the Scrum artifacts, the Scrum roles, uh, the Scrum accountabilities? How does it affect the sprint? How does it affect what's going on beyond the sprint? And 
I, I think the main the main challenge that we've had in building the class and in continuing to maintain it. So as stewards of the class, it's not just about you know writing it and uh, creating and publishing. We need to continue to work on honing uh, the message and the delivery and enabling the, the trainers, the professional scrum trainers that go all over the world and, and teach this class. Um, I think the main challenge is finding the right balance of depth of the discussion around metrics and all of the, you know, we have, Daniel has tons of knowledge and tons of ideas that you know, would be great to deliver in a class. I have tons of examples and concepts that we want to bring into it. And, and Steve has his own perspective uh, as well. And we hear from trainers that have delivered the class. We want to do this and we want to do that. And curating all of those ideas into two solid days that aren't just, you know, push everything that you can in, in, into those two days. Um, but instead, you know, pull in just enough of the concept so that people see the light, understand the new mindset, and have a good set of practices and tools that they can use to make some changes in their scrum team the next day, the next week, um, in, in a way that doesn't overload their senses during the two days, that, that's a challenge. I mean, that's a tough challenge. You know it, you know it from the professional agile leadership uh, uh, class. Um, <laughs> every conference talk that we do, the challenge is not coming up with new concepts. The challenge is curating them and getting down to, you know, half of the slides that we're originally thinking um, would make sense, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point there it's we're really curating that experience to give people the tools they need to walk out the door and take action in their organization the next day right we could we could load them up with theory which is why we, we refer to daniel's book we, we refer to other books on you're right on the agile leadership side we could spend a month talking about that topic there's endless there's an endless stream of leadership books available there's endless streams of theory but what we're really trying to do is get people to go back to their organizations and take action that leads to um, impacting people's lives in a, in a positive way, right? These flow metrics, it's not just about getting as much work through a system as possible. This leads to joyful work. This leads to sustainable mm -hmm. pace. This leads to you know, that elusive work-life balance that people talk about but can't measure. Well, guess what? Flow metrics, flow-based thinking, gets you to sustainable pace, right? You learn that a 60% utilized team gets far more work their throughput is better than that 100% utilized team. All right, that's interesting. So how do we give people slack? How do we give them time to think? Uh, how do we encourage people to take vacations? Because these teams outperform. And we can demonstrate that with flow metrics. And it's it's really a fascinating, uh, fascinating topic, but I think it makes your scrum practice better. And, and I've actually, I've, I've gone on record in saying this. I know it's somewhat, some people will say it's, it's, it's a little controversial, but I, I think Professional Scrum with Kanban is is just a, um, it, it's just, a, a, it's the modern way of, of performing Scrum, in my opinion. I, I think bringing these practices into a Scrum team, bringing the concepts of flow, um, you know, optimizing the, the system of work at play, still inspecting and adapting the product at the end of the sprint, but looking at the system and the people and the practices I just I think this is the new table stakes. This is how you you get that competitive advantage. No argument here. <laughs> uh, one comment I'll make is that this makes even more sense as more and more people are talking about DevOps and continuous deployment, and some of those people are saying Scrum is irrelevant for us anymore. But then you take a look at you know what we're talking about, which is the combination of um, very effective flow throughout the sprint, beyond the sprint, and you see that basically what we're doing here is if you if you're familiar with Gene Kim's uh, freeway ways towards DevOps, 
uh, first thing, first way is to apply systems thinking. So looking at the entire flow of work from need or desire all the way to value uh, and validation of value um, and using a, you know, a common system to be aware of that whole system, that's step one. Amplifying feedback loops, that's empiricism together with flow and limiting work in process so that the feedback loop would go faster and faster and looking at uh, work item aging to grab those items that the whip limit wasn't good enough for and running them uh, faster as well and stopping from time to time in your retrospectives um, and in your sprint reviews to continuously improve what you're doing and what you're building I don't see anything else, you know, these days out there that is a better way to to work towards DevOps and continuous deployment. Um, this notion that you know there's only one increment at the end of the sprint and you cannot deploy during the sprint um, has the same grounding as the fact that Scrum teams need to use burndown charts. Both are nonsense. Scrum teams that can create increments every day throughout the sprint and deploy them and gather feedback and review that feedback in their sprint review and discuss where to go next while everything is already in production. Those are awesome Scrum teams. This is how I would like to see Scrum teams uh, operate moving forward. Not every team would be there. Not every team needs to be there. But... There is no better empiricism than that. Yeah, I, and for teams, if this sounds interesting to you, so this is uh, there's an interesting opportunity. Yuval has agreed to to come to the Midwest, so he's going to join us in Indianapolis, August 12th and 13th. Um, we're going to bring the the professional Scrum with Kanban course uh, to the Indianapolis area. I think we're actually going to teach up in Fishers, so North Side. Um, but this is an awesome opportunity, especially if you're in the Midwest. To, uh, to check out this class firsthand with one of the stewards. So Yuval is flying in. We're going to co-teach this thing. Uh, that'll probably turn into me saying a few things here and there and Yuval saying a lot of really interesting things. But uh, we'll see if I can keep up. But uh, we'll be co-teaching this August 12th and 13th. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. If these ideas have sounded interesting to you, if you've always thought that, man, there's just there's, we can apply Kanban principles, values, and practices to scrum teams in a meaningful way to help them achieve high performance. If that's always nagged at you, but you haven't been sure quite how to do that, I think this is the class that, that brings that forward. It really, it, it turns your sprints up to 11 and teaches you how to really check out those metrics that matter, um, really great forecasting techniques. I think this is really, this these ideas are a game changer. And if you're interested, um, there's a, early bird is still in, in effect. Um, it's a great opportunity to get into this class uh, at a Midwest location. We'll put a link in the show notes to it. Um, we hope you can join us. I think this is going to be a fun exploration of how optimizing flow as opposed to burn downs uh, could be an interesting way to help your teams improve and grow and improve their processes and practices. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. So Yaval, this is the point of the show. We've already kind of done a shameless plug, but anything else you have going on? Again, you're with Agile Sparks, do a ton of Agile transformation and training work all through the United States and Israel, and I would imagine all across the globe. Anything else you have going on that you'd like to promote? Anything else that uh, the listeners need to know about? Well, I think the the class in, uh, in August is the most interesting thing uh, at the moment. Um, I do want to say that if people find Scrum interesting and believe in Scrum and they find Kanban interesting and you know believe in flow or want to implement flow and they're also looking for you know a way to scale the work that they're doing, um, and I would say, especially if they're already looking at something like the scaled agile framework for it, you know, it's going to be a semi shameless plug. Uh, what I'm going to say is 
if you're an agile list at heart and you're looking at safe, just make sure that the you know the people that you go to for safe training and safe transformation support or for scaling support in general, they understand agile. They understand Scrum, they understand Kanban and understand Flow. Um, I'm, in, I'm kind of on a mission um, to make sure that people that, um, there are a lot of people that gravitate towards safe, the scaled agile framework. It's an amazing um, marketing machine. It's an approach that has uh, a lot of merit, a lot of problems as well. Um, if you don't use it the right way, Kind of like um, every powerful tool has limitations and uh, risks if uh, you're not trained well to use it. So I'm kind of on a mission to help people use SAFE safely, help people understand SAFE from the perspective of empiricism and flow and see professional Scrum, see professional Kanban uh, in it. Um, and, it, it, you know, the more people... I can train and help to use safe well. Um, the the fewer people are out there that are very dangerous with safe. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I, I think it's an awesome mission. You know, bringing uh, professional practices to bear, and so I certainly appreciate that. So, Yuval, really enjoyed the conversation. I'm glad we were able to talk about professional Scrum with Kanban, flow metrics, some of these lean principles, the the math behind it, I know some of that gets um, a little heavy, but man, just really awesome practices that uh, I think can really help scrum teams. And I think that's why you and I get the most passionate about it because we've actually seen the improvements uh, that come when people burn down the, uh, the burn down charts and, uh, or actually when they burn up the burn down charts and really start yes. looking at flow and it, it makes a difference. And hopefully we get, uh, we, hopefully we get the chance, not hopefully we will get the chance uh, to bring this message to the Midwest, and we're looking forward mm -hmm. to seeing as many Agile for Humans as listener, listeners as possible join us as we explore the sprint, we explore flow, and we figure out really how to get uh, that next level of high performance out of your team. So, Yuval, thank you again. This was a ton of fun. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, can't Pleasure. wait till yeah, I can't wait till the next time. See you soon. You're listening to Agile for Humans with Ryan Ripley. Learn more at ryanripley.com.